Good, 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 after, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Nyebeze, and uh, I am the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization with the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation. And I would like to welcome you to this, uh, to this webinar. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to uh, our speaker today. Uh, his name is Roman Belak, and he's the president of Cleantech Geomechanics, Inc. And he's going to be speaking to us about uh, a really innovative uh, case well bore compressed air storage technology, which we uh, are convinced is going to um, make a significant difference in how energy is, uh, is, is, is stored, uh, in particular, taking advantage of storing energy subsurface. Uh, Roman, go ahead. So thank you very much, Charles, for that introduction. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending where you're at, Charles. So first off, a thank you to Charles and Semi for the opportunity to uh, present this uh, information in this webinar. So as uh, Charles stated, I'll be talking uh, now about the cased wellbore compressed air storage system as a subsurface geo energy storage system. Quick profile on CTG or Cleantech Geomechanics. We're a Canadian startup company developing geo energy storage systems. Our area of expertise is environmental geomechanics. Uh, we're moving forward with the CWCAS process as an innovative uh, technology. And certainly going forward, we're looking for various industry partners for demonstration and project deployment of this process. We're, we're currently active in Singapore and in Australia. So why, why CWCAS? What are the issues that we're, we're trying to address in the energy storage space? Um, there's various needs that I think uh, the process is uh, very, uh, is it, that this is a powerful process in addressing. First and foremost, a versatile energy storage is, is required. Many energy storage systems, including large scale battery systems, um, actually can be fairly linear and very uh, just uh, restrictive in some degrees in how they're applied. Uh, with our process, it's an easy rapid installation with quick integration into renewable energy projects. It has scalability, as you'll see, you can upscale very quickly so you can start small and move big as your needs progress quite cost effectively and quite quickly. Uh, we have site ability, that is a word I invented, meaning location independence. Uh, with many compressed, larger scale compressed uh, or larger volume uh, compressed air storage systems, they're very much location dependent. As you'll see, uh, for various reasons, our system is not. It's also cost effective and, and very safe for the long term, so quite versatile. Part of that versatility also allows for multiple applications, whether it's industry, mining, as we're interested in uh, here this morning, uh, certainly or some oil field applications, utilities, et cetera. So uh, in all those particular sectors, we're looking for moving forward with decarbonization, allowing uh, more effective use of renewable energy by providing the, the necessary energy storage. Uh, in various jurisdictions where you have legacy oil field or geothermal wells those wells can be repurposed or converted into uh, cwcas wells uh, there's of course some limitations and things that have to be done but nonetheless it can be it can be used uh, we're also looking at applications in the oil sector where you can uh, it's a huge issue is flaring of gas you can use that gas so instead of running your compressor off renewable energy you can put in a compressor that runs off flare gas. So you convert that flare gas, basically a waste product into a, uh, a useful commodity on the downstream side. So it gives a new meaning to uh, co-generation in, in oil fields. We won't be talking about that too much to, today. Uh, moving forward, there's big, big issues. Unless energy storage is properly implemented, certainly Australia has this issue, uh, there it, it will, the full potential for economic development won't be realized. Uh, we see that now in some jurisdictions, uh, curtailment is happening. There's just too much renewable energy coming onto the grid. The grid can't handle it. So the regulators are shutting down temporarily and sometimes for many days and weeks, uh, which of course impacts the investment and the economics. So our system with our versatility mitigates those curtailment risks. It allows for arbitrage, peak management, you know, the classic uh, buy low and use when prices are high. 
I think there's some very significant applications uh, to mines in that regard. We've had some interest in that from various uh, mining operations. And depending on the scale you want, the system is ideally suited for grid, off-grid, behind the meter applications. So overall, we, can, uh, we feel we can very cost-effectively and safely improve the supply and usage of renewable energy sources and uh, truly make wind and solar dispatchable. Uh, and the last point, but not the least point, is our system you'll see uh, mitigates many of the environmental impacts that are associated with other energy storage systems, cost and safety issues, etc. So those are the issues that are out there and, and we believe our CWCAS process addresses and mitigates uh, just about all of them. So as a quick review to get everyone on the same page, what exactly are we talking about when we say geoenergy storage? So CWCS is really what we call an advanced type of compressed air energy storage system, as you said, as you've just seen with many of the advantages of this process, as well as increased versatility. Essentially, we use an array of deep sealed well bores. Uh, my background is environmental oil field uh, technology, as is my uh, partner in this company, uh, Dr. Maurice Dussault. So really, we took our experience with deep sealed well bores from the oil and gas industry and uh, have reconfigured them uh, as sealed, if you will, storage vessels deep in the subsurface, uh, a low volume, high pressure, high temperature storage system. And again, depending on the scale, you can use one or more wells also depending on the power output uh, that you need. But as far as compressed air energy storage system goes, it is a low volume, high pressure, high temperature system. It, it is uh, thermal storage as well within the well bore and surrounding rock, which vastly improves the round trip efficiencies involved with compressed air energy storage. So basically it's an innovative system, we believe. As, you, as you've seen, it's versatile, safe, and hopefully I can convince you that it's cost effective cost effective with a small surface footprint and a long life cycle. We'll also be talking about the uh, cradle to grave environmental impact uh, in, in future slides. But that's essentially the, uh, the idea behind it is using deep sealed well bores from the oil field sector repurposed to provide low volume, high pressure, high temperature compressed air energy storage. So basically there's four steps. You take ambient air, you have a compression system with a series of compressors. They're multi-stage of course. Uh, ambient air is compressed with these compressors um, from a grid or off-grid system. Storage, uh, the storage aspect, stage two, uh, the compressed air is stored at high temperature, high pressure in these cased well bores. Our base case design is about 50 MPA, which is about 7,200 PSI and the wells can hit 200 to 200 degrees C. Uh, of course, compressed air at those pressures goes much higher, but uh, you have well bore restrictions as well as expander restrictions in terms of the temperatures that can be sustained. Stage three, the compressed air when you need it is released from these well bores through a well head and valving system and it's expanded through a turbine to uh, to generate the electricity and the, and the power output that's required. At the end of the process, again, multi-stage expanders, the air is just released to the atmosphere and you know, integrated with that expansion system is, is a generator system that delivers your, your power output. So pretty straightforward, four stages. So what does a typical well bore look like? That's really the heart of the system, uh, the depths, you know, just to get your storage volumes can be anywhere from 500 to 1500 meters. They could be deeper, but this is our base case design. Uh, we're typically looking at a storage volume a ratio to depth ratio of seven cubic meters per hundred meters of depth. So again, our base case design, the total well bore volume WBV is running about 70 cubic meters. Again, depending on the scale of the system and the drilling equipment available, this can be, uh, you know, bit more, but less than 70 cubic meters. Maximum storage pressure, we've uh, already said, 50 MPA or 7250. Again, maximum is what we feel is our sweet spot, but certainly well bores can be designed to go con considerably higher than that. But our maximum storage temperature is on the order of 200 degrees C. Again, there's expander equipment issues and, and well bore construct issues uh, that limit that temperature. And a typical well bore diameter is running about a 30 centimeter uh, casing size. 
So the highlights, as I said, this, this wellbore gives us uh, a low volume, high pressure, high temperature, we call it HPHT capability. Uh, with those specifications above, you can store up to about 10, easily 15 megawatt hours of energy per well with a fairly long life cycle, as we'll discuss shortly. And to put that in a context, this has been a new business for me and understanding what megawatt hours are, et cetera. So megawatt hours, of course, in terms of energy is the equivalent amount of the electricity used by about 300 Canadian homes during one hour. So that sort of puts it into scalable context. And, and there lies the scalability. You can start with one well, two wells. If all of a sudden your storage needs increase because you're, your usage needs are of course increasing. It's as quickly as drilling another well, which takes about two weeks, tie it into the system and, and you've doubled, tripled, et cetera, your storage capacity. Uh, these wells can be installed in any geological environment, very well understood from the mining and oil and gas industries. It really just depends on the type of drilling rig you need, but the end product is the same, whether or not you're in hard rock or softer rock. And as I indicated, very flexible, installation which gives you that that scalability just by adding in additional wells as needed. So that's it uh, from a wellbore standpoint. So there's the general process flow that we've just described just to make sure everyone gets it. I'm showing it in a, a one well configuration but again easily multiple wells. You just need to upscale the compression side and the, and the discharge uh, expansion side. So I won't go through this again, other than to say, you see at the right hand side there with expansion, uh, the fuel combustor. That's of course there on expansion, you need to add heat as uh, the ther thermodynamics require. But of course the system is a high temperature system. So you're storing temperature within the well bore. You're also storing temperature in the surrounding rock, which only increases with continued charge in, in discharge cycles and multiple wells. So you can scavenge heat obviously from the well directly into the uh, expansion system, but you can also scavenge heat from the surrounding rock and add it as required, which puts the whole system towards a adiabatic process and allows you to hit something close to 70% round trip efficiencies. If you, for whatever reason, just add in heat externally, uh, that's what that fuel combustor there shows. Then that's more of a diabetic process and your efficiencies drop to about 55% round trip efficiencies. I show that there because in some industrial applications we've looked at, they're not that worried about the, the heat storage at the wellbore side because the industrial process generates a lot of waste heat and they can supply that directly to the expansion system in any amount of BTUs we need. So although it's diabetic, it's highly efficient for the client in that they, they can use waste heat, which then of course drops the cost of the wellbore installation, the expander, et cetera. So various uh, flexible installations uh, and designs that you can use, which I believe would be an advantage to uh, mines uh, and various industrial applications. So in essence, this is a picture of what you're, you're looking at. On the left is what a CWCAS Geo Energy Storage System would look like. Now I lifted that from an oil field application, but that's exactly what you would get, just uh, multiple well bores in the ground spaced, you know, what is that, five, 10 meters apart with just well heads sticking up. Each one of those wells could store between 10 and 15 megawatt hours of energy. So you've got between 40 and 60 megawatt hour storage facility. On the right hand side, you have more of a conventional battery energy storage system rated to about 80 megawatt hours. And you can see some comparisons. Our capital cost of installation, we believe is actually closer to about $300 per kilowatt hours right now. Each one of those well bores should take you 20 years with some minimal maintenance, whereas comparative to a uh, a large scale lithium ion battery storage system, the CapEx is higher and that's a moving target. It's very hard to track down what is the true installation cost of, of these things, but the, the low number seems to be about $600 per kilowatt hour. And certainly organizations like Tesla claim their batteries last about seven years before you have to recycle them. Uh, sort of the benchmark number right now is about five as, as, as we can tell. So there's a quick snapshot of uh, more or less apples and apples of, of what you would get. And you can see, I think the CWCAS system 
not only economically is, is viable, the well life cycle is quite viable and the surface footprint is, is, is quite a bit smaller. So in terms of a cradle to grave environmental ass assessment, now this is a very big issue in many jurisdictions that are embracing energy storage in a big way, particularly Australia and Singapore, where we're quite active, as I mentioned. There are a lot of environmental impacts with battery storage. I'm not here to slam battery storage, but to slam battery storage a little bit. Environmental impacts of large scale battery ESS is still challenging in many, many jurisdictions from heavy metals, as we see in the second point, to you know, exactly what is the hazardous waste cycle and energy consumption and equivalent greenhouse gas emissions in the construct of these batteries. You can see the data uh, listed there in the third point. It's, it's actually not that attractive. And of course, uh, one of our engineers, Wayne Park, that is on this uh, uh, call as well, has, has tried to nail down levelized cost of storage with batteries, and many of them don't properly account for the recycling disposal requirement that's required for batteries, so there seems to be a hidden cost there. So overall, battery ESS really needs, if you're going to buy into a large-scale system, or a mid-scale system needs to really be compared carefully with alternatives in terms of long-term sustainability. Now in the past, those alternatives have been fairly limited, large-scale pump hydro, large-scale compressed energy storage, et cetera. So battery ESS to some degree can rightfully claim they stack up pretty well. But with our process, this geo ESS system that mitigates the bulk of these environmental impacts, uh, I really believe uh, we can be a very viable alternative to, uh, to battery energy storage. So the value proposition, as we've indicated, uh, compressed air uh, or the CWCAS system is an advanced type of compressed air energy storage solution. It provides a real alternative in the energy storage space for, for power management as a very low cradle to grave environmental impact. And I just realized cradle to grave also is CTG. So uh, don't confuse that with the company name here. Uh, energy capital costs are going to be at, just even at this initial development stage, less than $320 per kilowatt hour installed. We believe that number of course will come down significantly as expander costs come down and drilling costs come down. We have a low levelized cost of storage over a 20 year lifespan, assuming that the system is generating about 10 to 15 megawatt hours of energy. We expect on a commercial basis to have a levelized cost of storage of about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Right now at the development stage, we're at about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. And of course, for those of you that uh, wanna know what LCOS is, that's, that's the entire cost over the life cycle of your energy storage project, your CapEx, your OpEx, your repair and maintenance, et cetera. So uh, as we drive it down towards 10 cents per kilowatt hour, that becomes very, very competitive on a commercial application scale. CWCS, of course, increases the reliability of your energy supply in electrical generation systems, uh, decarbonization in, in, for an industry such as the mining sector. It's a compatible, depending on the scale you want, with grid applications, grid support, off-grid, behind the meter systems, which again, I think the behind the meter approach may be attractive to, to the mining sector, but uh, discussion for people far smarter than I am in the mining sector. And the real powerful aspect of CWCAS is its versatility. It, as to summarize, it's not site specific, it's easily installed, it's got a flexible installation with scalability. Uh, many of these other systems, you have to know how much capacity you need for the next 20 years and just go with it, whether you need it up front or not. With ours, you can easily just add in additional wells quite cost effectively and, and, uh, and spend the money when you need it. That gives you multiple applications as we've talked about. And really a very strong point that I initially really quite didn't grasp. It was our Australian colleagues in the Australian sector we're talking to really uh, made clear that they see the safety and the long-term storage capability of the CWCS system as a huge, huge advantage uh, for their energy storage needs. And of course, as we've talked about, it's quite cost effective. So the markets we're chasing, I won't go through them all, but of course, item number three, industrial applications in mines. Uh, 
Uh, I know there's a big push for decarbonization, reducing your CO2 footprint and intensity behind the meter applications. This system truly is ideally suited uh, for that particular application. And as I said, uh, CTG, although we're a Canadian company, uh, we're registered in Ontario, but our operating office is in Calgary. Uh, we're just developing the Canada and U.S. market. Uh, it's a little bit in reverse. Our largest sectors we're pursuing right now are in Southeast Asia and Australia, where we're in Singapore. We're actually in the project design phase for our first project to go into the ground with uh, government stakeholder support. So multiple applications and hopefully in the mining sector in Canada will we'll be moving forward here fairly soon. And certainly the support of SEMI is very substantial and very significant towards that effort. So thank you once again to Charles and, and the SEMI team. Last slide, going forward, this is how we run any sort of project development. You of course have to do a technical feasibility study. You have to look at your various issues as listed there, but it really comes down to, we have the capability courtesy of very smart people like Wayne, a virtual prototype simulation capability. So at the end of the day of that TFS, technical feasibility study, we can simulate virtually the entire system uh, before you know you put shovel in the dirt. That allows you to do a proper front end engineering design, get your regulatory approvals in place, put it in the ground, and and then operate it. And CTG has flexible business models to meet the client's needs. So pretty straightforward. That's me. If uh, you need any follow up, and uh, once again, thank you to the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation for this opportunity. Charles? Awesome, Roman. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, and thank you for just making so clear what exactly the value proposition is here for energy storage. Um, I have a question here that I got on, on private message. And the message is, uh, can, can this solution use existing boreholes? Yes. So that's a great question. And the short answer is yes. That's sort of that. Um, and that's not sort of, but that's that point that I made that I said we weren't going to get into too much was that, yes, you can use legacy wells from the oil and gas yeah. upstream sector as well as geothermal sector. But those wells, keep in mind, are not always drilled and completed and operated for high pressure, high temperature conditions. So you, of course, have to recomplete a well, uh, an oil field well to seal it up plug off those perforations, pretty standard technology. But in doing so, you, you may actually reduce the volume that's available to you a bit. And of course, unless it's got the right casing, et cetera, your pressures might be limited. So your overall storage capacity may be restricted, but in an oil field, you may have 300 wells. So you make up the storage volume and number of wells as opposed to volume per well. So the shorter answer is yes, of course, you can reconfigure existing wells for this type of system, but you need to take, uh, you know, the, that last slide in terms of the technical feasibility study has to be properly done so that you, you understand the recompletion costs and the final recompletion configuration and, and make sure the overall system can meet your, uh, your storage needs. Thank you for that. Versus a bespoke well that you're drilling from scratch. Okay, thank you, uh, Roman. Uh, the next question, we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, the next question is, uh, how many projects do you have running with a CWCAS system in Canada? Shorter answer is none. So <laughs> our first project uh, that'll be at the field scale will be in Singapore. The next project will be in Australia, likely. And, and as I said, we're, we're trying to get this this technology going in Canada, although it's a Canadian technology and a Canadian company. Uh, we've had quicker success in getting the product to market in our Asia Pacific sector. So we'd, uh, we're certainly looking for our first opportunity in Canada to, uh, to do this. Thank you for that answer. And I want to just add that, you know, this is something that Sammy is very interested in and is helping, uh, you know, Roman and the team is to try and identify that uh, early adopter in Canada. So we're very much interested in, in sourcing that out. Uh, the next question here is, um, is it possible to get a reference for, um, uh, maybe it's a quotation for a 600 kilowatt hour cost of battery storage? Yeah, I mean, a reference. Uh, we can dig in and find the, you know, that's, that's simply out of a literature search uh, that we've done. So uh, we can dig down and find the correct literature that, that frames that. But as I said, it, it's, it's, that number is a real moving target. It's, it's hard to get, but there are some good papers out there. Uh, you know, I can get, uh, Wayne's been looking into that for us. So 
uh, we can certainly provide follow-up in that as required. Excellent. Okay, another question here is, um, I guess it really is a question of cost estimate. Would you be able to provide a number for a 50 megawatt hour plant? Uh, sure. I mean, I'd have to do a little bit of, uh, of, of looking at that, but um, your energy capital costs will come down because, of course, your two biggest components, surprising it's not compressors. Compressors are a bit of a shelf item. Go to Walmart, buy a compressor, go type of thing. Not quite. Um, the well cost is highly variable because rig cost is expensive, in particular mobilization costs of the rig to site. But once the rig is on site, the more wells you drill, the cheaper your per well drilling cost is. You know, it's, it's, it's obvious if you can spread your mobilization and demob costs along more wells, then your installation costs go down. So, so we'd have to look at how many wells and the size of those wells. But, you know, the more wells per installation, that would drive down the cost as well as the expander cost. The small, surprisingly, the smaller the scale the expander, and Wayne, you can correct me here, I believe it's sort of five megawatt uh, capability is the cutoff. They're fairly expensive the lower you go, less than five or less than three megawatts. The higher the capacity of the expander, the cheaper it becomes. But, but overall, expanders are a custom build and a custom design, so they're a bit expensive. But uh, certainly, the, the higher the spec, the cheaper those units become. So we'd have to do a little bit of a, a cost analysis on the drilling side and on the expander side. But uh, it would be less than that 320 per kilowatt hour installed number. OK. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. And I, I think we'll, we'll have another follow up with uh, a guest who's asking the question offline. Um, there is another, no, 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 it's a question, but it's uh, there is an ES select tool that NR, NR Ken has online. Uh, I guess the question here is, are you aware of, of that tool, the ES select tool from NR Ken? I'm personally not aware of it. I can defer to Maurice uh, Dussault if he's aware NRC, of that. NRC, my, my correction, that is NRC. Yeah, National Research. Maurice, do you uh, have any comment on that? Maurice? <laughs> I guess Maurice does not. So uh, no, so the short answer is I, I'm not aware of that tool. Okay. All right. This is Maurice, can you hear me now? Go ahead. I, uh, I just had my, my mute off here, sorry. Uh, no, I'm uh, not, not uh, I, I'm aware of the uh, NRC tool uh, and uh, you know, I, it, in, in, I have not used it. I'm aware of it, but in my view, uh, this is a little bit outside of the boundaries of what their tool covers. And I stand to be corrected on that. I looked at it some, some time ago. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I do have another question here. Uh, the question is really so speaking about uh, that there are several types of CAES systems, mine shaft refurbished in the UK, salt mines, uh, underwater. And the question is, what advantages does your system have over these systems? And uh, also, do you have any IP uh, for your system compared to these others? Well, the advantage is, if you, is my value proposition slide uh, on there? Yes. Yeah, so if you look at the, the second to last bullet or the, the fourth bullet, it's really the versatility of our system that is the advantages. The fact that it's a low, so, so all those mining systems are what we would call a high volume, low pressure, low temperature system, right? So you've got to go to very large scale. Uh, they're, they're, they're applicable to large scale grid type support systems. They're very site specific. You need a mine or an X mine to install it. Uh, you don't have uh, you know, much scalability involved. And of course your efficiencies are, can be tough because you don't have that thermal component. You, you have to add that in on the expansion side. So. You know, therein are all the advantages. CWCS, although it's compressed air energy storage, does not have any of those concerns as indicated on the fourth bullet on your screen. One, two, three, four. Yes. We're not site specific. We can go small scale where we can go, we're easily installed. We have flexible installation with scalability. You can start off with one well and ramp up. You can even start with one well and go low pressure. So you're operating at five megawatt hours and then simply by increasing your storage pressure, et cetera, you can, you can double your, your storage capacity. Um, that gives us multiple applications. And again, 
where we are similar with with the larger scale compressed air uh, energy storage system is the safety in the long term, but of course I, I think our we're we're a fair bit more cost effective too. But it's really the nub is those three sub bullets. You know we're not site specific. We're easily installed. It's flexible and it's very scalable. Those are our core uh, advantages over a conventional large volume, low pressure, low temperature CAES system. And what was the second part of that question? Charles? Yeah, the second part of the question was, uh, do you have any IP for your system? Compared yes, to in short, yes, we have pat in international global patents pending. Okay, uh, we do have one more last question here because we're reaching to two o'clock. And the question is, uh, what is the noise level of your system? Well, the noise level is how much noise does your expander and does your compressor give off? So have I done, uh, you know, has hazardous study on decibel levels? No, but if you're running an electrical compressor, that, that's pretty quiet. Uh, I have no idea what the noise level of an expander system is. Um, your largest noise would be high pressure air coming out of the, the wellhead, but of course that's not, uh, that's not uncontrolled. That's controlled through a series of valving and wellheads. So, you know, the noise of the system is quite minimal. It's, it's as much as just the noise the general operating team there makes from uh, an equipment standpoint, not, uh, not very noisy. Uh, Maurice or Wayne, you have a comment on that? Yes, uh, Wayne has a comment. I'm going to unmute him in one second. Go ahead, Wayne. Hi, uh, so if, uh, well, it all depends on whether the noise is a concern or not for your project. If noise is a big of a concern, then you can you know, add some more components to either on compressor or expander, and you can manage noise level to, you know, uh, to your target, I guess. Thank you for that answer. Folks, you know what, we do have one or two other questions here to go, but what we'll do is uh, we'll get those answered in the Q&A that will be included with a copy of the presentation and with a copy of the link to the recording that you'll get. So I just want to thank uh, Roman and, and the team for, for and Maurice and Wayne for the presentation. And I'm going to ask Roman and uh, the team to say maybe a few last words before we end the presentation. Go ahead, Roman. Well, I just uh, want to thank, of course, again, Semis for the opportunity and everybody's time and patience uh, to get through this. Uh, we really do believe, although this is a new innovative technology and we have not installed it in Canada yet, all the components, as, as we described on the second slide, are, are fairly well understood from the wellbore forward. Uh, so we're hoping for an opportunity uh, when the mining sector would be ideal to get uh, perhaps a demonstration project up and running and uh, have the opportunity to, to prove this up in a, in a real industrial field application. I just want to comment, Roman, that uh, a demonstration project would be a, a, maybe a single well full-scale prototype. In other words, demonstration, but conversion immediately to a utility. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. Are we in any last words? No, uh, I think. Uh, I'm good with this. <laughs> thank you for listening. Okay, again, thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to end our presentation now, and please look out for the presentation and uh, recording and question and answers in your email. Thank you. You take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Good day. Bye-bye.